Welcome to the Tudor Dixon Podcast. Today, we are going to chat with someone you've likely heard about on the news for her recent decision to step away from the Democrat Party and join her Republican colleagues in a state that's getting a lot of news buzz of late. <laughs> state Representative Misha Maynard represents a district in Metro Atlanta, and up until recently, she considered herself a lifelong Democrat. She, choose, she chose to walk away from the Democrats after facing intimidation and backlash for breaking rank with her party over her support for school choice legislation. And all of you who listen, you know that I talk about school choice all the time. I choiced my kids into a private school and it was the best decision we possibly could have made. And I just feel really strongly that this is something everybody should be able to make that decision. And this is something that it sounds like Representative Maynard agrees on. So I'm excited to get into that conversation. But really, honestly, it got to the point where Representative Maynard said of the Democrats that not only were they not making a difference, but they were literally sabotaging the community. This is also something we've talked a lot about because if you feel like you can't get an education, if you aren't able to read, then where does that leave your future? And I think that's something that we can kind of get into as well. But right now, I just want to welcome Representative Misha Maynard to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. This is a, a big deal in Atlanta for you to walk away from the Democrat Party. And honestly, when I heard this, I thought, well, she's probably not going to run again. This is this is the, like she made this choice and maybe she's going to step out and she's going to do something else to try to talk to the community. But I find it interesting because you are running again. You're raising money. You brought your daughter on with you. So tell us a little bit about that decision. Is it intimidating? Do you fear that this is going to come back to, to haunt you? I'm definitely running again and I plan on winning the race. Um, so send people to MishaMainer.com to help me support that cause. But you know what? At the end of the day, it's about policy. And I could be in office representing the people that um, voted me into office and do things that are counterintuitive to their well-being. And I'm choosing not to do that. And what I hope happens is that since this is such a big statement, um, I'm hoping that people really start to dig a little deeper into policy because these are issues that you know, minorities typically do not delve into, especially if they're in underrepresented communities. And so my urge for them is to understand why Democrats are defunding the police, why Democrats do mm. not support you mm. um, having choices for your children, and why Democrats are ultimately supporting systems over people. It's very suppressive and oppressive, um, to say the least. It's interesting. We had someone on here a few weeks ago and he said, you know, I, I he was, a, I guess what we would call an army brat and had grown up in a lot of different areas. And he said, I noticed that as I was growing up, people saw the country, their, their vision of the United States was from the perspective of where they live, which makes sense. He said, but that's why certain state reps and folks that run for office, when they try to go into an area that is not they're the way they grew up. They don't really understand how to connect. So this is going to be a different place for you because typically a Republican is not running in the, the race that you're running in, but you have that experience. You have that life experience. You come from a place of knowing. How do you reach out to people? Because I've talked a lot on this program about the fact that just going out and talking to people is not enough. How do you get them to do that research, especially in an area where they've been told for so long, this is this is not good, that the police are bad, that school choice is bad. What made you say, we've got to have police, we've got to fund police and stand up for that? Because that's a pretty big issue in communities like yours where people, I mean, you've got Stacey Abrams out there saying that the police should be defunded. How do you fight against someone with that kind of a voice? Abrams endorsed my opponent the last race, and I won with three people in a race 70 mm. by 70% mm. of the vote. Um, so in my district, I would say that Stacey Abrams does not have a voice. Um, next. <laughs> I, <would say> that. <laughs> um, I know, right? <laughs> so next, I would say that for three years, I've been in office, and for three years, I have campaigned on the same things I'm going to campaign on as a Republican. I campaigned on school choice. 
interesting thing is I have the most charter schools in my district than any other district in the entire state of Georgia. So wow. my parents already wow. are asking for choice and the options that they have are still not enough. Coming in, I supported the um, school choice bill for children with disabilities. I'm a physical therapist. This was another bill that mm. the Democrats were against. Mm. So it's policy issues like this that have already happened, where even as a Democrat, I've already gone to the community and said, look, this actually doesn't make any sense what they're doing. Um, I had no intention, of course, of switching parties, but it was clear to me from the moment I walked through the Capitol that the policies um, were just not ideal for communities of color, especially underrepresented communities. And honestly, they're called underrepresented because they are not represented. You know, it's because of policies like um, trying to do away with school choice. That is not representation. So that is why people are underrepresented. Well, I mean, it happened in Michigan. They redistricted here in Michigan and we really all the black voices in Congress just disappeared. The way Democrats redistricted, they made sure that they had white representatives for mostly black communities, which seems like a very strange situation where you don't have somebody from their own community being able to speak up for what they actually need and what they see children needing. You said something that I think is interesting. You talked about disabled kids and kids with disabilities. That is something that we saw during COVID. And I just wonder if this kind of, if that pushed you to have this view a little bit harder because that was something we saw during COVID where kids were taken out of school, but the kids with disabilities suffered the most because not only do they need that structure, but they need that support system that's outside of their house. How do you talk about that? I mean, especially as we look at COVID and we see the, the federal government saying, oh, there's going to be another shot. There could be more sh shutdowns. We see Kentucky has just shut down a couple of their school districts. How do you fight for those kids? Because when you talk about an underrepresented group, I mean, those parents are struggling just to get through the day. You have the opportunity to speak for them in a way they could never have the time to speak for themselves. You bring up multiple questions. Um in that statement. So I am a person that is for choice in all regards. And so there are, there is an uptick of COVID, right? I know someone in the hospital right now from COVID surprisingly. And so however people want to deal with COVID, I think it's their choice to deal mm. with COVID the way mm. that they want to deal with COVID. For those parents that do not have an option where they need to put their child in school or whether they need to keep their child at home, you need options. And that is what the school infrastructure is supposed to be built on. I'm going to give you a really good practical example. There is a school in my district during COVID. The school was billing, okay? The school was billing for children with special needs and there were no children with special needs or getting special needs care. And wow. So there's also an accountability issue. Um, and the school system chose not to do anything about it. They did an investigation, but they still chose to do nothing about it. That is so important because the number one thing that people say that are against school choice is that they need more money. But in the same breath of saying you need more money, you also don't want to have any accountability issues in place. Uh, you make such a great point there because that's something that we haven't been able to really put into words the way you just did is that we're calling for accountability for these schools. And it, it's not the teachers. It's not the people that are working hard every day. It's the people that are deciding how that money is getting spent. And oftentimes, if you dig into that, it's not the way it should be, isn't it? Absolutely not. Um, Atlanta Public Schools, their budget is 1.5. Last year, it was $1.5 billion. And with $1.5 billion, their schools were only 2% of the kids are meeting math proficiency, only 3% are read making reading proficiency. Um, there were a group of parents in my district that gathered together and began protesting because they're digging into it. They're from a higher socioeconomic group, so they have the resources to dig through the budget. And it was found that the Atlanta Public Schools spent $100,000 on a lunch for legislators. Uh, what? I know. I did not go to that lunch. I'm glad that I didn't. Uh, but yeah, Whoa. 
about you need money, legislators are not used to going to lunches for a hundred thousand dollars. Honestly, when you're reading in math proficiency is that low, which we see in school districts across the country. I mean, if you look at Detroit, you see similar numbers. If you look at Flint, if you look at Chicago, if you look at Baltimore, we're seeing similar numbers across the country. And we keep hearing from Democrats, well, there's different ways of doing things. And there's, you know, you have to get in and do unique things. But this is one area where it doesn't seem like we ever try to improve. And I think that because of what you just said, they just they get the money. The budget's there. The $1.5 billion, it's there. It, it doesn't matter if you fail or not. It's still there. But it seems like when the parents stand up, they have to then do something. They have to try, or they at least are hearing from the parents, hey, we have a product that we're not happy with, and the product is going into our kids' lives, and it's affecting their kids' lives. But why is it so hard for us to go to places? Is it just that we don't have we don't have the connection? I mean, I know when I when I ran for office, people are like, oh, I mean, you're not going to make a difference in Detroit. But is it just that we don't have those connections to to reach out to those parents and say, you deserve better. You absolutely deserve better. You should not accept this. We do have those resources, but that goes right back to are you represented or are you underrepresented or mm -hmm. just not represented mm -hmm. at all? So it's my responsibility. I'm not on the school board, um, but I am responsible for the largest piece of Georgia's budget, which is education. Um, and I also have children, so I'm a vested um, constituent as well. And so it's my responsibility to go to people and say, this is not right. These are your rights. These. This is what the the system is supposed to be doing for you. You are not getting this. This is who you contact. This is who you make complaints with, right? People don't even know the basics. Um, and so I pride myself, honestly, on just giving people resources, um, giving them a voice. Um, you know, there was a bill that I tried to pass last year, which was going to allow students, not students, but make schools give their school report card to the parents every year. But there was mm. backlash with that because the superintendents and the school board did not want parents to know that their schools are failing because a lot of parents are sending their children to school and they have no idea that it's an F or a D school. Oh, wow. I guess I hadn't even thought about that. There is the chance that it's just completely hidden and you don't even know how bad it is. And honestly, I will say that was kind of, I mean, not that we had a, a failing public school here that my girls were going to, but to a certain extent, as a mom, when my kids went to kindergarten and first grade, I had a lot of trust for the school. I just, you know, I sent them there and I felt like, they're they're going to come home and they're going to read and and we read at home it's not that we didn't but when my youngest went to school about first grade the teacher said you know we don't the one is she's struggling to read we don't know what the problem is i mean she might be dyslexic she might be this she might be that and it suddenly struck me like there's not a lot of extra when someone is struggling in some of these schools there wasn't the resources, even though they say they're putting all this money into resources, the resource we really needed was someone to help the kids with reading. And there weren't a lot of great resources in that area, which I can think of nothing more important than knowing how to read because you can't do math, you can't do history, you can't do anything if you don't know how to read. And then we moved during the pandemic, we moved to the private school and the, the amount of attention was just so different. And so from my perspective, I'm like, I didn't even move them because I felt like they weren't getting the attention they should get. Then when I did, it was like that same situation. I didn't know. And then when I did move them, I was shocked by the difference in their education. And it shouldn't be that there is such a stark difference between a private or a public school or a charter and a public school, but there's a lot of different ways of teaching. There's a lot of different ways of educating you said you talked about getting the pushback from the superintendents and whatnot. You got pushback from your own colleagues too, though. The Democrats said, "Hey, we're not a fan of this," and that was really what led you. I, I, from my understanding, one of the reasons that led you to join the Republicans. Now, there would be people that would say, "Why not stay a Democrat? 
try to influence the Democrats and get back in office because there are there's a great fear that with an R next to your name, you can't win again. Um, you know, you're absolutely right on all of those statements. Um, the only thing I can say is I could have stayed a Democrat, but fundamentally, I do not believe in a lot of the things that the Democrats in Georgia are doing. I can't speak for the other states. I can't speak at the national level. But in Georgia, I do not believe in what the Democrats are doing at the state capitol. It is detrimental to poor people. And I shouldn't say poor people, but lower socioeconomic um, people. And I just cannot be a part of that. It is, I just left Boston. Um, Boston is home of the abolition movement. I saw one of the first classrooms of African-American children. I walked the streets where Frederick Douglass walked. And education was so important then. Um, and we have the capacity to make education just as important now. And the leadership is making a choice not to make it important. What a powerful story, though. F Frederick Douglass was able to put writings out that people were able to learn from. I mean, exactly what you're saying with holding the schools accountable. If you don't have that information, you can't go forward without Frederick Douglass learning to write and read and then bring other people together around that cause. I mean, does it almost seem like there's a benefit to keeping people from reading? <laughs> it's a benefit only for the people that benefit from people not being able to read. So I could say the prison system may benefit, right? Because if you can't read. Yeah, right. It, that's then exactly then right. Then most likely um, it's a great chance you're going to end up in prison. The teachers union, they benefit um, for suppressing children. But children don't benefit and parents don't benefit, families don't benefit, and ultimately community safety doesn't benefit. We need to educate our kids. And you said something earlier. The local school boards have the ability to change the curriculum. It could be a Montessori curriculum. Mm -hmm. We are in 2024. It could be an artificial intelligence <laughs> curriculum. It could be anything that they want it to be. But there's a lack of creativity at the local school board level. And that is why private schools um, are far, you know, soaring in their test scores compared to the public schools because they're being a lot more creative in how they're teaching children. Well, and they kind of have to be because you're asking people to come there and pay. And so people expect to receive a good product when they pay for it. It's like, you know, even the church will say, well, we like to have people who join into something, they have to pay a little bit of money because they feel invested in it and then they take it more seriously. And so I, I think that on both sides, when you send your kid to a school that you're invested in, you are invested. The school is also invested in you because they have to earn your trust. They have to earn your money. Um, that has been one of the arguments for having that relationship between school and parent. And then the public school, they don't have to. They just keep getting that money. But the question that I have is that how can it be that you can, I mean, if I'm a manufacturer, because that's my background, I come from manufacturing. So I think about it from that standpoint. I'm like, man, if I had one production line that had 5% good product and everything else was scrap. I was throwing away 95% of the product that came off of this production line. I couldn't stay in business. I would be done. My customers would say, I, we can't wait for the product. This is ridiculous. Everything would, I couldn't afford the, the cost of it. It would all be bad. It would all end up in the trash can. We would be out of business. Why do we allow and on any level? I mean, even from, from like you're talking about from the capital, why are our legislators and our the, the folks that are making the budget that are sending the money, they're not saying, hey, w wait a minute, we cannot continue to send you money if you get you have 3% good product coming out of your school. Because I, I consider if only 3% of the kids can read, you have failed. But it's so much bigger than a product. You have stolen their lives, their future. And you're right. If you can't read, your chances are of ending up in prison. We can actually predict the prison rate based on the reading rate, and the literacy rate in the town. And when you look at a town like these towns in, in Democrat areas where crime is running rampant, 
you can go directly back to the schools. Why aren't we saying, okay, no more money until we get those numbers up? I don't know. I can't answer that question. If I was in charge and I had that leadership position, I would probably be doing things a lot different. But at the end of the day, um, there are Republicans and there are Democrats in our society. And we can't make drastic decisions, um, I believe, because there are Democrats in the system. So mm. even though the system is not working, um, we still need to educate Democrats. And, you know, you said something profound because you gave the example of manufacturing, right? And then you also mentioned private schools, they must provide a product. Well, the tax dollars are the same, right? We're giving even more money to the public schools than a private school. And so maybe it's a question of pe some people not understanding what their tax dollars are doing. You may just be paying your taxes thinking it's something you have to do, but you may not realize, okay, your money, your money went to this school to not only educate your child, but to educate everybody else's child too. And so I think we need to teach communities that they're vested because of their tax dollars. And your money should have value. That's the thing that you should be getting something for every dollar. I think you're so right about that. And something, it's a way I haven't really thought about it before. We, we think of this as, you know, this is my duty. I've got to do this. I don't really get to follow it along because there's people in a certain place that make this, but, but everybody, I mean, you all work for the people. Everybody in, in Lansing, Michigan works for the people. Everybody in Georgia works for the people, Florida, you know, whatever state you're in, you are working for the people and our tax dollars, we should be saying, well, what are we getting back? Because it doesn't matter. You're right. You're exactly right. It doesn't matter if your child is going to that school. The child that's in that school is impacting your community, either for the positive or the negative. And so if we start peeling back the layers of, of education versus crime and that kind of thing. I mean, if we look at a, a Baltimore and say, man, these people are afraid to go out of their houses at night and the reading rate is so, so low. Those two things are actually connected. So at what point do we say, we're going to hold them accountable, the people who make the budget, we're going to hold them accountable to saying, you only get this money if you're actually producing something good. If you, in your area, you, you also fought against defunding the police. We've seen all of these stores moving out of these big Democrat cities. In your area, what does the, the crime look like? Are you Do you have a low level of crime? Are you fighting crime on a regular basis? Uh, we have high crime. So I'm in the middle of Atlanta. And so if you visit Atlanta, you're most likely staying in my district because I represent Midtown, Atlantic Station, some you know, popular trendy areas. So it doesn't matter if you're in the low socioeconomic side or the higher socioeconomic side. It doesn't matter if you're in a community of less educated or more educated. Every single community in my district is facing crime. Mm -hmm. um, and so when the bill came up in Georgia, I think that was two years ago, um, it was we will not allow local um, jurisdictions to defund their police department. And my constituents overwhelmingly contacted me and said, we do not want to defund the police. Interesting. So that was another um, stance that I took against the Democrat Party. Um, I'm listening to constituents. I'm not sure what they're doing. That is so, it's so interesting because if you listen to the national narrative from the leftist media and Democrats, it's like, no, this is so important. We still have Democrats that are out there saying defund the police. It's so important. This is, this is not fair. But I mean, who do you call in the case of emergency? That doesn't reduce crime. If you're in that situation where you need help, you've got to have the police. It just seems so backwards to me that we're actually fighting this. And I think that this happened, you know, this happened Obviously, in 2020, there were some pretty horrific stories that came out of Atlanta. I think it was was a little girl's name, Sequoria Turner, that was. And that I mean, we think about that. I think she was eight years old. She just was caught in the crossfire and lost her life. And, and we're talking about 
making it even less safe for little kids to be running around. And as a parent, I just cannot understand that. It seems like you have a lot of support because of these views. So obviously you have not been too concerned about changing over from Democrat to Republican, but what is it looking like? I mean, what have you heard from the people on the ground? Because I think that all of us who are out there concerned about the country, no matter what letter you have next to your name, well, I would hope that most of us are saying we want to see the best for the country. But like I said, those of us who don't live in metro Atlanta, we don't know what the people there are thinking. So what are you hearing and how can that help people across the country to go, OK, maybe we need to talk about this differently so that we can reach people? You are so right. It is about messaging. I think the Republicans have the ability to take every single minority vote if the messaging were different. Hmm. Um, this is what I can say most definitely my constituents know what they want I'm giving them what they want I'm not going to be asking my constituents at the next election to become a Republican I will be asking them to cross the ballot and vote for me um, you can continue to vote all Democrat if you like but just vote for me so we're getting that message out right um I will say this, though. I think that we really need to um, understand the demographic. It doesn't matter if it's urban. It doesn't matter if it's rural or suburban. Everybody has a different voice, and it will be it's imperative that Republican leaders go outside of their comfort zone. Um, and I say outside of the comfort zone because there are very few minorities within the Republican Party. In fact, it's a stigma to be a part of the Republican Party. Yep. Um, and I'm willing to help anybody with those messages um, because it is just that important. And if I do feel like I'm going to win, if I did not win, I would not regret one single thing because I do not believe in what the Democrats are doing. <laughs> Have you had people across the country, because I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying, and it's it's the message that we had here in the state of Michigan, and you're right, we didn't get it out to the right people in the right way. And I think all of us are going, how do we do this? Have you had people in the Republican Party across the nation reach out to you and say, hey, can you help us? I have. Um so I've actually been all over the U.S. and I'm still traveling um, around the U.S. I was in Boston and I spoke to the Boston GOP um, to give them some ideas on what you can do. We were in a community called Roxbury, which is known to be a heavily minority um, district and just giving them some ideas because it's hard to say we need to do this if you're not a part of that community. Yeah. And I'm not yeah. saying that all minorities are the same, but there are some cultural things that are that cross, you know, neighborhoods, if you will. Sure. And I, I spoke to Ronna McDaniel. I went to the presidential debate, um, had the same conversation with her about messaging um, and even here in Georgia. So I think the Republicans are open um, to it. They've definitely been receptive to me and the ideas that I have because it is about principle, it is about values, and it is about keeping our country um, safe and the greatest nation. You know, we don't want it to fall. <laughs> I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that Republicans see what's happening in these cities and there has been a hesitancy in years past to try to have these conversations, but the the heart the the heart space where republicans are is we want people to be able to thrive we want that american dream available to people we want people to get a great education and move on and we don't know how to make it make help people understand that that's really genuinely what we want and i mean I'm, everybody's different but i think for the most part the idea is that people are shocked by the amount of crime that has risen over the past few years that we're accepting this you see i just saw last night a video, and I don't know how recent this was, of people running into Home Depot and just just walking out with, you know, take, stealing all of the, the power tools. I mean, we've seen the pictures of people going into the Nordstrom's, into the Walgreens. And it's like, 
at what point do communities have no stores left? And then we go, oh, shoot, we should have actually done something. And I think that the point is we don't want to get there. We want to be able to talk to people. We want to be able to have representation that really, like you said, really represents those folks. I, I love that you say they're not really representing you. Well, that's actually true. And you really are representing what's best for these folks. Tell everybody before we let you go how they can find you again. Tell them where they can help to donate, help to make sure you get in there again. Okay, thanks. It is MishaMainer.com. And that's M-E-S-H-A-M-A-I-N-O-R. All of my social media tags are pretty much the same at Misha Maynard. The only one that's different is Facebook, which is at Misha for Georgia, and that's F-O-R, but MishaMaynard.com, you can find everything. Well, we hope you get a lot of help. I love what you're talking about. We, of course, have the same message, and I so appreciate having you here today. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us on the Tudor Dixon Podcast. For this episode and others, you can go to TudorDixonPodcast.com and subscribe right there, or check out the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And join us next time on the Tudor Dixon Podcast. Have a blessed day.